Matthew chapter 24, we pick up the reading in verse 32, Matthew 24, 32, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Jesus says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. But surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. But surely I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and in an hour that he's not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, it's been uh, a few weeks, it's been, actually, you know, thinking about it, it's been a month since the last time we were together in the Gospel of Matthew, studying through. You know, for me, uh, it just seems like it's been forever. So much has occurred. A lot of good things have occurred in the church. You know, we've got to hear a lot of good speakers in that time, too. But it's so nice for me to be back together with each of you, digging into God's Word verse by verse and chapter by chapter, as is our custom here at Calvary Chapel. And I do want to encourage you, would you be praying for our uh, time together on Sunday mornings that God would move mightily in our midst and that um, he would bless and anoint the simple teaching of his word. Well, just as a quick overview where we have been, Matthew chapter 24 starts out with Jesus' disciples asking him, hey, you know, when, what will be the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And we covered that. Uh, verses 1 through 8 in a study. After that, uh, we looked at the church and the tribulation, verses 9 through 28, and we covered that in a study also. And last time we were together, we took a look at the differences between the rapture and the second coming of Christ, verses 27 through 31. And again, that was a separate study. And we saw in that study that those two events were completely two different events entirely. Um, and now we're going to continue with Jesus' exhortation to his disciples, right, to be ready for his return. Verse 32, Jesus says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it, or more literally it should be translated, he, know that he is near, at the doors. So what's Jesus talking about here? Saying, learn this parable of the fig tree. I mean, there he is with his disciples. He says, hey guys, look over here. Look at this fig tree. Okay? You know, when you see the fig tree, when you see the branches uh, become tender and it starts putting forth leaves, uh, what do you know is about to happen? And each of the disciples would have answered, well, yeah, summer's near, of course. So I want to give you two uh, views now on what verses 32 through 35 uh, mean. The first view, Jesus tells them in verse 32, he says, now learn this parable from the fig tree. 
when its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer's near. There is a view that would say throughout the scriptures, the fig tree is used symbolically of the nation of Israel. You got Jeremiah 24, Hosea 9, Joel 1. And then many uh, believe that Jesus is using the fig tree here as a type. He's using the fig tree here symbolically of the nation of Israel in these passages. You know, and what many scholars believe Jesus is saying here is that when you see life being breathed back into the fig tree, back into the nation of Israel, then you'll know that his return is near, even at the very door. Uh, so again, many scholars believe this is a reference to Israel becoming a nation. What Jesus is saying in their view is when you see the nation of Israel, when you see its branches becoming tender, again, when you see leaves come forth, then you'll know that the Lord's coming is near, even at the very door. Now, that happened, right, it's in our past, but it happened exactly as Ezekiel prophesied in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel prophesied about 600 years before Jesus was born, uh, exactly as Ezekiel prophesied, said it would happen, Israel became a nation. May 14, 1948, right? Do you know that uh, liberal scholars used to mock that prophecy? They used to mock it. They're like, there's no way. It'll never happen. You know what? It's never happened before. There's never been a nation that's died out that has ever been reborn and reestablished as a nation again. It's impossible, right? But just as Ezekiel said in his vision of the dry bones, right, it happened to the nation of Israel. And many scholars believe what Jesus is saying here is when you see these things take place, you'll know when you see the nation of Israel come about again, you'll know that his coming is near, even at the very door. And Jesus goes on to say, verse 37, As surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take, all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So what generation is Jesus talking about? Well, again, it appears the, gener uh, the generation that Jesus is talking about is that generation that witnesses the life being breathed back into the fig tree. Uh, that generation that's alive when Israel becomes a nation again. And that's the view of many biblical scholars. And for years, people took the generation, it took a generation to mean 40 years. So they say, hey, Israel became a nation in 1948. You add 40 years to that, Subtract seven for the uh, tribulation. So 1980, 1981 is when the rapture of the church is going to happen. And uh, you may recall back then there was all kinds of literature during that time. 1981, 1982, 1984, 85, 87. You know, I remember back in 1988, there was a book titled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. What do you think the author's sequel to that book was titled? It was 89 reasons the rapture will be in 1989, you know? So people, you know, they've set all kinds of dates when the Lord's going to return. And we're going to get into why we shouldn't do that in just a few minutes. But if you lean towards this interpretation that Jesus is referring to the generation that sees Israel become a nation again, and you want to do a little more study on your own, it's interesting to look at Genesis 15. Because in Genesis 15, we're told that a generation uh, can be 100 years. He says in Genesis 15, you know, it tells us how Abraham was told by the Lord that his descendants would be in bondage in the land of Egypt for 400 years. And then in Genesis 15, 16, says that in the fourth generation, they would return to the land. So biblically, a generation can be between 40 years in a hundred years. If you use a hundred years as a generation, you have 1948 to 2048, right? The generation that's alive during those years is going to see the rapture of the church and, and the return of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said in verse 34, surely I say to you, 
this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Okay? So that's one view. The second view, which is the view that I lean towards, it's a much simpler one. And, uh, you know, uh, admittedly, it's probably a less popular one too. But Jesus said, now learn the parable from this pig, fig tree. When the branch is, has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, well, see all what things? I think contextually in the chapter, those things that he's speaking about, the things that Jesus said would be the sign of his coming, right? Widespread spiritual deception. We looked at it in verse 5. Uh, wars and rumors of war. We looked at that in verse 6. And uh, famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places mentioned in verse 7. So you also, when you see all these things, the things we've been studying about in this chapter, the things that we've agreed that are present in our world today, and not only present in our world today, um, but are increasing at a dramatic rate in frequency and intensity, just as Jesus said they would, preceding his coming, pre preceding his return. So you also, when you see all of these things, know that it is near at the doors. As surely I say to you, this generation, this generation that sees those things, will by no means pass away till all, things, uh, all these things take place. It's the generations that see these things uh, take place with increasing frequency and greater intensity. You know, they're the generation that will not pass away. They're the ones that will see the rapture of the church and the return of Jesus Christ. Now, given, this is the way I see it, given the context of this chapter and the New Testament teaching of the eminent return of Jesus that he can come at any time, you know, that's, that's the view that makes the most sense to me. But, you know, uh, that's the view that mo makes the most sense to me today. I'm open for conversation and I'm open to be corrected. Um, but, you know, uh, the fig tree may be used as a symbol uh, of Israel. And this is the, the way I think it through. It may be used as a symbol of Israel. But to me, to think that that's what Jesus is talking about in this verse is a little bit of a stretch for me contextually. But here's the good news. Whichever interpretation you lean towards, it doesn't matter, I think. Either way, suffice it to say, we're living in interesting times. We're living in the last times because either way, it's clear in my mind, we're the generation that Jesus is speaking of here. We're the generation that's seen Israel become a nation again. We're the generation that's witnessing an increase both in frequency and magnitude off the charts in some cases of the things that Jesus said would precede his coming. Jesus said this generation, the generation that sees these things, regardless of the view that you lean towards in interpretation to these particular verses, this generation will no means pass away until all things take place. He continues, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. If the Lord says it's going to happen, then it's going to happen. If the Lord says it, he's going to return for his people, for his bride, for his church, well, guess what? It's going to happen. You know, it's a surety. You can take it to the bank. You can count on it happening exactly as Jesus says it's going to happen. His return is in our future. And I believe it's in our near future. 1948, it was a significant date. You might want to write it in your Bible, May 14, 1948. But it's also very interesting as you continue to watch the events of uh, things that are happening in Israel. In June 1967, something very significant happened, right? Anyone know what happened in June 1967? What? No. Yeah, it was a six-day war. It was a six-day war, right, when Israel took Jerusalem back, right? Little Israel being attacked by Egypt, Jordan, and Syria all at once. 
And Israel took these three huge nations on. And as you study the Six-Day War, you realize it really is. Man, it was a David and Goliath, modern-day David and Goliath story. There was no way literal, little Israel was going to be able to repel these three huge nations had not God intervened. And not only did they repel the attack, right, taking on these three nations, but they also uh, acquired, took control of part of the enemy, enemy's territory. They could, took control of the Gaza Strip down near Egypt, down there in the southwest. Uh, they took the West Bank. And, you know, the West Bank, you've heard so much uh, about the West Bank in the past. You know, the West Bank is important because it included Jerusalem. That was very significant. And then they also took the Golan Heights, which is also very strategic territory for the nation of Israel. The Golan Heights are up there in the north near Syria. But what's so significant about what took place in 1967 is found in Luke 21, 24. Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's why 1967 is such a historic year for what took place, because up until 1967, the Gentiles possessed Jerusalem. And in 1967, Israel took Jerusalem back. It's very significant. Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Right? We're presently living in the times of Gentile and the times of the Gentiles. We're presently living in a time where God is sending out messengers, you know, into the highways, into the byways. Uh, and whosoever is willing can come. Everyone and anyone who's willing to come can come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But there's a coming day when the fullness of the Gentiles will come in. At that time, the church will be raptured up into heaven, and that will trigger the seven-year period known as the tribulation, right? Where God is going to deal specifically with the nation of Israel, but also he's going to pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. Well, hey, Gear, you know, didn't you just say that in 1967, Jerusalem was no longer trampled under the foot of the Gentiles? Didn't you say that? Doesn't that mean that the fullness of the Gentiles came in in 1967? Uh, the answer is, in a sense, yes. That is what happened. And it's very possible that the Lord could have come back in 1967. How, how many are happy that the Lord did come back in 1967? I got saved in 79, you know, so I'm quite happy. And you know what? It seems like right now we're just presently in this overtime period, this extra time. Things are winding down, right? But the Lord is long-suffering. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So what we see is the Lord could have come back in 1967, but it seems like things are continuing in this overtime period. The Lord allowing uh, those final people to be saved and to be brought into the family of God. Uh, and, and that's what it seems to be going on today. Now, it seems that way because prophetically speaking, right, there's nothing left to be fulfilled on God's prophetic calendar before the rapture of the church can happen. Everything is, is uh, all the boxes are checked on that prophetic calendar. The rapture of the church is the next event on the prophetic calendar. 1967 is a very significant date. And this parable that we're looking at is a very significant parable. Jesus said, when you see life being breathed back into Israel, when you see all these things take place that I've, that I've mentioned with increasing frequency and uh, magnitude, they're like birth pains, then you should know that my coming is near, even at the door. The generation that witnesses these things will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And it's verse 36, he says, but no one knows the hour, uh, no one knows that day, and I, but of that day, I'll get it straight, of that day 
and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, of heaven, but my Father only. You know, I don't know why, especially in light of this verse, I don't know why, it's amazing to me, just how many people want to set a date for the Lord's return. You know, I mean, uh, so many people want to set that date. And, and when you challenge them on this scripture, what do you think? You know, you challenge them on that date with this scripture. What do you think they say? Well, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is something like, yeah, but, you know, it cracks me up. And then they go on to give you some ridiculous explanation why Jesus's words that you see here, they don't really mean what you think they mean. And they'll tell you how their research, you know, and their access to the facts has led them to know the exact day. And if you question them regarding their conclusions, you know, somehow you're in jeopardy of losing your salvation. You know, it's just amazing to me how often men set dates. And I've talked to a lot of people who have told me, you know, in conversation that they know when the Lord's coming back. And every time I tell them, I know when the Lord's coming back too. And they say, oh yeah, when do you think he's coming? And I'll say, at a time that you least expect it. That's when he's coming, right? But then they often continue and say, but I have it all worked out. And my response is, oh yeah, you know what? All I know is that Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour. So if you have a day, an hour already picked out, already worked out, then you know what I know is that it's not going to be that day. So you're, you're automatically wrong. The Lord says here that we're not to set a day. The day or the hour, you know, because no one knows. Only the Father in heaven knows. And we need to be careful. And I can almost promise you in the next, you know, year or so, next few years, we're going to see articles. We're going to see published literature, you know, stating that the rapture is going to happen on such and such a date. And, you know, that person, somebody has it all worked out. And that person, somebody, you know, they're going to, they're going to, uh, you know, uh, gain a huge following, right, up until the day. You know, and, and, you know, the Lord would tell us, don't fall for that kind of stuff. It's true, we don't know the day or the hour, but it is important that we recognize the signs of the times that we're living in. And at the very beginning of this chapter, Jesus told his disciples the signs that would precede his coming. Again, widespread spiritual deception that would take place on a greater and greater scale. People coming, claiming to be the Christ, deceiving many, right? We'd hear of wars and rumors of wars, he said. Nations rising up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, factions within the nations rising up. And there'd be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And all these things, Jesus said, would happen with greater and greater frequency and intensity prior to his coming. So we're to recognize the signs of the times. We're to recognize the signs of his coming. In fact, you might remember when we were back in Matthew 16, you right, might remember how the scribes and the Pharisees were, were rebuked by Jesus. Remember, Jesus told them, you hypocrites. You know, you can look at the sky and deduce what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. You know, red sky in the morning. Sailor take warning, red sky at night, sailor denight, delight, whatever. You know how to read the sky, he said, but you don't know how to discern the signs of the times. So Lord, help us to realize the days that we're living in, the signs of the times happening all around us. It's just incredible to me how if you're watching news or you're paying attention to your news feeds, that it's just like reading Matthew 24. Well, verse 20. Uh, sorry, 36, Jesus says, but on that day, and out, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. It's interesting, uh, it's an interesting passage as you think through who Jesus is, right? He's the eternal God in human flesh. And people will say, but doesn't this verse somehow contradict that, right? I mean, you know, if Jesus is God, isn't he all-knowing? You know, how can it be that he doesn't know? Only the Father in heaven knows the day and the hour of his return. And honestly, you know what? I don't know. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I don't pretend to know the, the mind of God. If he was small enough for me to 
uh, understand he wouldn't be big enough for me to worship. He wouldn't be big enough to help me in my time of need. But I think the simple answer is somehow in his sovereignty, he's chosen not to know that day or the hour and just to leave that up to the Father. You know, I think he, he would be fully capable of doing something like that, couldn't he? I think he could. So, you know, for me, I don't really really concern myself with these types of debates, you know, whatever. The point is, <clears throat> no one knows the day or the hour. Verse 37, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, what were the days of Noah like, right? This verse should instantly take you back to Genesis chapter 6. In fact, keep your finger here in Matthew 24, and turn with me back to Genesis uh, 6. We're not going to spend a lot of time on, on this this morning, but we're going to take uh, just a few minutes to look at what it was like in, in uh, Noah's day. <clears throat> Genesis 6, verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, is what it says. So the first thing we notice about the days of Noah was it was a time when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. You know, those scholars that study such things tell us that there were probably six to seven billion people on the earth at the time of Genesis 6, 1, right? You might remember back in the genealogies found in Genesis that people lived seven, eight, nine hundred years, uh, and, you know, they had kids all throughout their lives. So, the people that study such things in the world of academia, they tell us it's very possible that the population of the world was probably somewhere near 7 billion people. Genesis 6.1 tells us that men were multiplying on the face of the earth. And isn't it interesting today, we're seeing a population explosion in the world. I mean, uh, <clears throat> as of this month, April 22, 2022, it's uh, estimated that there are 7.9 billion people on the earth. You know what? Just last month I checked, it was 7.8 billion, right? I mean, we're increasing ever so fast. And more than half the people that have ever lived on the earth, from the time of the flood to now, more than half the people that have ever lived are currently alive today. In verse 2, Genesis 6, 2, says that the sons of man saw the daughters of men, uh, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. At first reading, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. People have all kinds of crazy interpretations what this verse means. But however you interpret this verse, however you see this verse, I think it could be summed up by saying that there's a lot of abnormal sexual behavior uh, at this time of Noah. So the question is, do you see any abnormal sexual behavior in our world today? I mean, all you have to do is turn on your TV set, right? See the abnormal sexual behavior of our world being displayed as normal, right? Nothing to be ashamed of, something to be accepted. I mean, it's hard to miss because it's in every sitcom. It's, it's in every movie, even every commercial that you think sex has nothing to do with, you know, selling their product. You know, things like Fitbit, Adidas, Adidas, uh, drug companies, they come to my mind how they portray abnormal sexual behavior as normal, you know, and so many others represent abnormal sexual behavior as normal, every day, <clears throat> nothing out of the ordinary kind of thing. You know, grade schools all across California, as well as in other states, present homosexuality to children as an alternative lifestyle, Right? Every high school, every college, God bless you, every high school, every college in America has an LBGTQ uh, club support group on it, you know, on its campus. And I think, you know, all of this, this input numbs people to the truth. And you know, it even has an effect on the church. Almost every mainline denomination today embraces homosexuality. Many mainline denominations today ordain openly gay uh, men and women as ministers. Genesis 6, 5, drop down a little bit. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of men was great in the earth 
and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was <clears throat> only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made men on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Excuse me. <clears throat> Tell me that verse 5 is not an accurate description of our world today. The wickedness and the evil intent of men's heart, the crimes that occur now that our elected officials refuse to prosecute. Right? Violent crimes are increasing at an unprecedented rate today. The, the, the curve is so steep. Drugs pouring over our borders like never before. Overdoses at an all-time high. Sex trafficking. You know what? 25 years ago, sex trafficking wasn't even in our vocabulary. Pornography. It's a $15 billion a year industry just in America. $97 billion uh, industry every year worldwide. And those estimates are 15 years old. How much has that industry grown in the last 15 years? America is the leading supplier of kiddie porn in the world. You know what? Involving over 300,000 kids a year from ages 3 to 10. Just here in America. You know, you talk about wickedness, huh? We could go on and talk about the wickedness of widespread abortion in our country. It's hard to get accurate uh, statistics um, because the, CC, the CDC doesn't report. Uh, it underreports abortions, partly because a lot of states don't report abortions at all. But it's estimated that there were 908,000 abortions performed in the U.S., just in 2020, right? 2020, 908,000. About the same number that died of COVID during the past two years. I mean, hey, where's Anthony Fauci uh, on this health crisis? Seems to be silent. I looked up the top reasons for having an abortion. 25% of all abortions are because the woman or couple are not ready for kids. They're ready to have sex, but they're not ready for kids. 23% of them can't afford a child. 19% are because they're done with children. That's the quote. They're done with children. It's estimated that there's over 125,000 abortions a day throughout the world. 125,000 babies killed every single day in this world. I mean, does it get any more wicked than killing babies? Genesis 6, 5 and 6 says that God saw the wickedness of men and evil intents of the hearts of men, <clears throat> their hearts being evil continually. I think that's an accurate description of the times we're living in, and it grieves the Lord. There are old studies on, on record showing that the typical American child watches 27 hours of TV a week. That's a couple hours a day, 27 hours a week. Uh, the world is indoctrinating kids with their values. The average kid spends 900 hours a year in school, but watches 1,400 hours of TV a year. How crazy is that? Between the ages of 3 to 12, the average child will, will witness 8,000 murders and 100,000 acts of violence. As Christians, we not only need to understand the signs of our times, but we also need to allow our hearts to break over the condition of this world because it grieves the Lord. I'm surprised sometimes when I hear what movies Christians are watching. I mean, I get it, okay? You know, we try hard to filter the things we watch on TV. You know, occasionally we'll be watching something and all of a sudden out of the blue there's an F-bomb, you know? Uh, uh, the TV goes off at that point for us, you know? Or there's a sex scene Usually what I do before I turn on a, a TV series or a movie to watch, we check the parental guide of imdb.com, see what it has to say. But I'm surprised what Christians watch and they think nothing of it. You know, hey, you know, other than a few sex scenes, you know, I mean, you only see her breast for four or five seconds. You know, other than a, a few dozen times they take the Lord's name in vain and, and uh, yeah, sure, there's a, you know, moderate use of profanity. I mean, it's not that bad. It, it doesn't actually really affect me. It's a good story, right? 
May God give us wisdom because it all grieves the Lord. And listen, I'm here to tell you, what you watch affects you. What you watch, what you listen to, the people you hang out with, it has an effect on you, either positive or negative. Right? May God give us wisdom. May God help us to take a stand for him as his followers and not to give into the flesh or allow compromises in our life. You know, I pray that God would give us a heart to turn off the TV, to turn off that movie. You know, I, I know it's hard, but we can't just sit there and watch things that grieve the Lord. And I'm not trying to be prudish. You know what? The point is in order to please the Lord and protect our witness. That's the goal. How can we effectively call people to come out of the world and be saved when we're engaged in the same things they're engaged in in the world? You know, it's hypocrisy. You know, may God give us wisdom. If you drop down to verse 11, chapter uh, Genesis 6, 11, says the earth was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with with violence. You know, it doesn't take a genius to, to see that's a clear description of our world today. We live in a violent and corrupt world today, don't we? Yes, we do. Well, Jesus says, flip back to Matthew 24. Jesus says in verse 37, he says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. What do you think? Is our day in time, anything like it was in the time of Noah? Yeah, I think so. And it's just another sign of the times we're living in. Jesus, Jesus continues, verse 38. For as the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark. You know, it's a picture of all things just continuing on like nothing's wrong. People just get up. They go to work. You know, they come home. They watch a little TV, they go to bed, and they repeat that cycle the next day, oblivious to the wickedness in the world. Life just goes on. And they say, end of the world? What are you talking about? You know, it's never going to end. You know, where's the, where's the Lord's coming? All things have gone on like they have from the beginning, right? It's, it's just going to continue to go on. And they just keep eating and drinking you know, going about the basics of life, marrying and giving in marriage, giving no heed to the preaching of Noah. What do you talk about rain? It's never rained before, you crazy old man. What are you talking about? You know, do you seriously think water's going to fall from the sky? I mean, no. say it with a straight face. Water falls from the sky. Come on, man. Noah, you're losing it. You need to, you know, get away from all those animals and live up, live life a little bit, man. I mean, the smell of those animals making you loopy. You know, in 120 years, Noah preached. The New Testament tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and he didn't have a single convert, not one convert, right? Other than his kids. And that, that actually is an amazing testimony that his kids were saved. It shows us that he, he was doing something right. But Noah didn't have a single convert outside of his own family. Be encouraged if people aren't responding to you and, and to your witness, right? You're in good company. It's our job to sow the seed. It's God's job to bring the increase. He's the one that is to deal with who's going to respond. It says people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day of Noah, in, that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the son, son of man be. And what a graphic picture the story of Noah is, right? Can you just imagine the people mocking and laughing? Rapture, rapture. You got to be kidding. You seriously think that there's going to be a, you know, a, a time when the Lord is going to come for his church? Okay, <laughs> let me get this straight. You think sometime very soon that there's going to be a trumpet blast and a whole bunch of Christians are going to be caught up into the air to meet the Lord? I mean, what church do you go to again? <laughs> you know, 
you've been in the sun probably a little too long because you're sounding a little half-baked. You're out of your mind. And it's similar how they must have mocked Noah, right? But can you imagine that day when the rain did begin to fall, just as Noah said it would, and Noah and his family entered into the ark, and God closed that door behind them? Can you imagine what went through the minds of the people? I mean, they'd never seen rain before. And Genesis uh, tells us that a mist watered the surface of the earth and that the fountains of the deep were broken up and the canopies of water surrounding the earth, that it burst and began to pour out on the planet. Can you imagine just how freaked out uh, everyone must have been? Perhaps, you know, and if you can picture it in your mind, perhaps, you know, those that heard Noah warn them about the coming judgment, wading in water up to their waist, right? Carrying their young ones, you know, dropping their suitcases because now that stuff is not important. You know, saying to themselves, man, if we can just get into the ark, we'll be safe. And the rain just continued to fall. And eventually, the ark just sailed away. You know, it was too late. And the people were left to face God's judgment. And so, too, the day is coming when we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And then, the se- and then that seven-year period is going to begin, a seven-year period of God pouring out his wrath on this place. How sobering uh, it is to think that there'll be people left behind. You know, not only people who didn't know, maybe never heard, but, you know, how sobering it is to think that those people who did hear, they were just going through the motions, playing church. They just played a game with God that they'll be left behind too. We're going to take a look at that when we get uh, to the parable of 10 virgins, uh, Lord willing, next week. But they look like Christians. They sound like Christians. They did things that all Christians do, but they didn't truly know the Lord. They didn't have a personal relationship with him. And you know what? They're going to be left behind. What a sobering thought that is. Verse 38, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. Now, you may read this and think to yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute. The flood came and took them all away. This is talking about judgment. And many people do read this and say, this isn't talking about the rapture. This passage doesn't have anything to do with the rapture. This passage is talking about the second coming, right? This is talking about when God's wrath comes and sweeps the people, sweeps all the people away. And it does seem to describe when God's wrath comes and sweeps people away. But the reason I believe it's talking about the rapture is, and you might want to underline in verse 39, and took them all away. And then underline in verse 40 and 41, the word taken, right? One will be taken, the other left. And again at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. There's two different Greek words used here. The Greek word in verse 36 is arrow, A-I-R-O, long O, arrow. And it literally means to pick something up and carry it away, right? But then, isn't it interesting, the Lord uses a completely different word in verse 40 and 41. In those verses, he uses the word paralambano, P-A-R-A, para, L-A-M-B-N-A-N-O, paralambano, right? And uh, when you look at the other places in the New Testament that that word paralambano is used, guess what you find? Matthew one twenty, you find the angel telling Joseph, right? Do not be afraid to take paralambano to you. Uh, do not be afraid to take to you, marry your wife, Right? It's used in the case that Joseph taking a bride to himself. 
It's used again when Jesus took Peter, uh, James, and John up on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus took them up and they saw him in all his glory. The word paralambano is used there too. Isn't that interesting? And again, when Jesus was speaking about the coming uh, for his church, John 14, 1 through 4, Jesus said, and you know these verses, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take, or as it's translated in our Bible, receive you to myself. That's our word, paralambano, take or receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, uh, be where I am, there you may be also. Three times it's used. Once of a bride, once of being taken up uh, into his glory, and the third time when Jesus returns for his church. I think Jesus very clearly uses this words in verse 40, 41, because he is speaking of the rapture. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Jesus says, very clearly, we're to watch. We're to be ready. We're to live our lives in such a manner that you're ready for his coming. And the way you do that is by watching. Paul writes repeatedly to the churches that we're to be eagerly looking for Jesus, eagerly anticipating his coming. John said in the book of Revelation, Revelation 22, 17, the spirit and the bride say, come. Right? Our hearts are to be yearning. Come, Lord Jesus. I'm so ready for you to come. You know, it's easy to get caught up in thinking, you know, the Lord's not going to come, at least not any time in the near future. Right? It's easy to lose sight of the fact that the Lord is going to come. And I believe with all my heart, that the desire of the Lord is for us to live every single day with an anticipation that he could come today. Personally, I'm seeking to live my life that way. Hey, am I successful at it at all times? No, I'm not. But you know what? I want to live every day thinking, Lord, you could come today. You know what? I want my life to count for you for eternity's sake today, Lord. Use me. If tomorrow was the last day you had to live for the Lord, how would you live it? You know what? I don't know about you, but I want to go uh, all out for the Lord. Crystal and Matt and I were talking about this very thing earlier this morning. I just want to, man, I want to be burned out in a good way for Jesus Christ, man. I do. Paul encouraged us through his life saying we too should press on for that which the Lord had laid hold of us. And the language is that language, uh, you know, used of an athlete training, striving to reach uh, his goal, to reach a maximum level of performance within the competition. So too, we're to press on. We're to lay hold of the reason that the Lord has laid hold of us. The reason he's laid hold of you. Right? Paul encourages us to press towards that goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Again, like an athlete, pressing forward to that day until the upward call comes. And that's how we're to live our life. You know what? What an advantage it is for us to understand the days we're living in. I mean, you know, uh, it's like hiking up a mountain. You know, I like hiking. You know, I'm a little out of shape. Tina, she hikes really fast, too. You know, you ladies have ruined Tina. It was bad enough before, but now she's got with you guys doing these monstrous hikes, man. 
But, you know, it's like hiking. You know, you're hiking up a hill. You don't really know where the top is, right? And you, you, you can be just around the corner from the top, but, you know, you're just so fatigued. You're so exhausted. You know what? I can't do it. I can't keep going. I got to take a break. And it's just so frustrating when you go around the next corner and you see the top was right there and you were just that close. You know what? It's just so frustrating. And the point is that it's a great advantage for us to know the hill we're hiking on. You know what? It's a mental advantage over anyone else you may be hiking with if you know the hill you're hiking on because you know how far you have to go to the top, right? And you know, I can make it. And then this, it's the same thing in our walks with the Lord, right? It's like an uphill climb in a sense. As you keep pressing on and pressing on, you can get to the point where you think, man, I just can't do it. I can't go anymore. I can't give anymore. I, I can't, I, I just, I got to take a break. But as you realize the times you're living in, as you realize how close we are, man, it encourages us and it strengthens us. You know what? And we determine in, in ourselves, I can do it. You know what? The top, the goal is just, just up ahead. I can keep going. I can keep pushing because I know the Lord is coming soon. So we got to press on. You can't give up. Live your life in such a way that you're ready for the coming of the Son of Man. For He is coming at an hour when you do not expect Him. Verse 45, when, Who then is the faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master's delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him at an hour he's not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We see here that the evil servant is the one who says, my master's delaying his servant, uh, his coming. You know, the Lord's not coming. I got time. You know what? I got plenty of time. It's not like I'm going to have to give an account for my life uh, to the Lord anytime soon. And this particular servant in the parable, looking at his behavior in his end, you know, it would appear that maybe he was not a believer. At least he was not a serious follower, follower of the Lord. The Greek word there, it's very interesting to me, the Greek word there in verse 38, translated evil, carries with it the idea of fruit that was once ripe, but then began to, to rot. It became rotten, right? And it's interesting to me, because of the attitude that the master was delaying his coming, it made that servant vulnerable to bad behavior. He began to beat his fellow servants. He began to eat and drink with the drunkards. In other words, he got caught up in a carnal lifestyle, right? And it's all because he said in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. How important is it that we have an awareness in our hearts and in our mind that the Lord could come at any time? We need to understand that if we believe that the Lord is delaying his coming, man, it's going to lead to one type of lifestyle. But the converse is also true. If we believe that the Lord could come at any time, that mindset will lead to a lifestyle of purity, right? I believe a lifestyle of purity is a result of believing that the Lord could return for his church at any moment. John said, 1 John 3, 3, everyone who has this hope purifies himself just as he is pure. I think there's a tremendous purity that results in living a life that expects the Lord to come at any moment. Am I ready? Right? Am I right? You know, am I ready for his return? That consciousness creates purity in our lives. God, help me to live that way every day. You know, that's the way I want to live my life. Living for Jesus with every breath that I breathe, with every beat of my heart, 
serving him while I'm eagerly waiting his soon return, serving him in an evil and corrupt world, serving him unapologetically, taking a stand for him. That's the way I want to live my life. God, help us to live that way. We also see that the, the faithful, wise, and blessed servant is the servant that when his master came, finds him faithfully doing the things that his master gave him to do until the day of his return. He was about the business he was supposed to be about, right? How we need to be about the business the Lord has entrusted us, trusted to us, right? We've heard, you've heard it said, and I believe it's very true, the church is like a football game, 22 people down on the field and 100,000 spectators. There's very few people doing all the work, you know? And while there's a whole lot of people in the stands saying, yay, go team, I'm rooting for you. You know, they're cheering for their team, but they're not involved in the game. You know, the thing that keeps me going is the people that are hungering for the word, people that are eager to serve, looking for opportunities to serve, because that's what it's all about. The pastor teacher is given to the church for the equipping of the saints that they might be engaged in the, the work of the ministry. And Paul continues there in, in Ephesians 4, saying that when every member is doing the work the Lord has for them, then the body is going to grow. Do you want to see our church grow? Do you want to see growth in this church, in this body? You know, get involved in serving in some capacity. Man, it's so exciting when every member of the body is engaged doing the work that the Lord wants them to be doing. You know, when that's the case, the body is naturally going to grow. The blessed servant is the one who was doing what the master gave him to do. Verse 47, as surely I say, Jesus, surely I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. The servant had this little job to do. All he had to do was just give out the food to the other servants. And when the master came, he, he, found, he was found doing what the master uh, gave him to do, the, what the master entrusted him with. And what happened? The master made him ruler over much. And we're going to read when we get to Matthew 25, 23, that the master says, well done, good and faithful servant. You were, you've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Man, that's what I want to hear. It's so important to be faithful with the little things that the Lord has given you. Just to be faithful in those things. Whatever that area is that the Lord has, has shown you as your ministry, it's so important to be faithful in that area and to give it all you have. Right? not giving up or quitting, you know, but willing to be spent in those things that the Lord has entrusted to you. You, you see it all throughout Scripture. Men who were faithful in the small things, God uses mightily in greater and greater things. Stephen, he was, he was a faithful deacon, and the Lord used him, uh, used him to just bring a, a mighty testimony to the leaders of the nation of Israel. He was a mighty man of God. You know, Philip, he too was faithful as a deacon. Whatever needed to be done, waiting on tables, don't care, I'm going to do it, right? Whatever needs to be done, whatever it takes. And God used him mightily. Revival breaks out under the ministry of Philip. Time and time again, we see it as people are faithful in the small things, the Lord has given them, uh, then the Lord entrusts them with greater and greater responsibilities. But again, the point is, we're to be those servants who are actively engaged in what the Lord has given us to do so that we'll be found doing those things when he comes. You know, we need to beware of having the attitude that my master is delaying his coming. It's the reason that I've spent so much time over our last few studies in Matthews establishing the fact that the Lord could come at any time. The church is not going to go through the tribulation. It's very clear uh, teaching in the scripture. But the Lord is going to return for his church before the tribulation. 
And we're present li- presently living in a day and age, right? Not where we're looking for the Antichrist. You know, not where we're saying, hey, you know, when we see the Antichrist, then I'll get serious about my walk with the Lord. No. We're living in a, in a time where we need to be ready, where Jesus encourages us to be ready, to be watching, to be looking eagerly for his return because he could come at any moment. Hey, let's pray if the worship team would come forward. Lord, I do just want to thank you for your word, your encouragement. Lord, your willingness to show us ahead of time the things that will take place so that we won't be caught by surprise. Lord, your encouragement to just be faithful, to just keep going because you're coming again for us soon. Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. We ask these things, Lord, uh, that you would work these things in our lives. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen.